This is KTN News. Well, indeed, thank you for staying with us here on the KTN Business Studio. On this second part of the show, we will be talking matters luxury, of course, uh, before going uh, live to our guest who is standing by at uh, the Kempinski here in Nairobi. Of course, uh, besides bringing you up to speed on various other conversations that are going on here today in terms of business. Well, to start us off, Moet Global Brand Development Manager uh, Pierre-Louis Aroy is in Kenya. As part of his visit, he has been having a candid conversation around the luxury consumption in East Africa. In partnership with the Luxury Network, the conversation brought together other players in the luxurious consumer segment, including Mercedes, Panisas, Ipsos, Innovate, and of course, Moet and Chandon. This is part of that conversation. Perhaps we need to take uh, a bit uh, retrospective look about Kenyan consum consumption patterns a few years back. They were Kenyan millionaires a few years back. But what the, one thing that they did very well was that they kept their consumption patterns. They only changed the venue. So I used to drink whichever brand I was drinking at that particular time when I was still a hustler in the Kenyan sense of the word. Then I moved to the right side of town. After I moved to the right side of town, I started frequenting those places. But I still want it the way I used to get it from the hustler side. That is changing. What is important, um, maybe I, 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 will, I will join the, this idea of what we are doing here. We are, we, the, the time now is changing between storytelling to story living. And uh, is deeply aspirational. And as it is deeply aspirational, of course, people who don't have the means yet are maybe buying a fake handbag. But in their dream, as soon as they will get the money, they will buy a real wine, a real, a real one. Uh, so this is why we have to, to, to have in mind that uh, it's not, it's, we are not looking at that. We are looking at aspiration, uh, building up things, and uh, creating experiences for those people educate them like that they can fully understand and appreciate the craftsmanship, the product, they are educated so they can recognize the quality. The aspirational persons, if you want to refer to them as Henry's, um, look, we have entry-level models. Uh, we, we don't tend to focus a lot on these entry-level models because people are already looking at something that is a higher level, higher specification and they would tend to lean more towards the used vehicle, um, let's say in an E-Class or an S-Class, or even in the uh, GLCs, GLEs, and GLSs, uh, because you're going you're gonna to get basically all the specification that you ever wanted, um, and you're not actually buying an entry-level product. These people who are aspiring to get to the level of top of their game, uh, they would rather be there already than start with the bricks and mortar at the bottom. So what they do is they go for a, a bigger model, a higher level class, um, but used. Well, indeed, uh, quite an interesting conversation right there earlier on today that brought together stakeholders from different parts of the world, different parts of the Kenyan economy and from different parts of Africa to literally discuss what exactly this luxury consumption proposition is, what does it mean to various stakeholders, and indeed, how do you then start to address and tap that well? We now want to hear that straight from the horse's mouth. And now joining me live from uh, the Kempinski right here in Nairobi is, well, Pierre-Louis Aro. He is a global brand development manager at, well, Moet and Shandon. He now joins us live. Karibu sana. 
again, a bienvenue. Now, first off, for many people, they... Asante. When you say luxury, what exactly does this mean? This is a word that is fluid. It means many different things for many different people. What does luxury mean to you? To you, luxury means uh, the highest level of quality. To us, it means consistency. It means also desirability. But in a way, what makes uh, luxury at Patreon very special is that we want to elevate every single moment of, of uh, people's life. That means luxury is having a brunch on the Sunday morning and just you pull a bottle of Moitichon from the fridge and you pop, up, you pop up the cork. And it was a normal Sunday morning and you just create, elevate a special occasion to celebrate life. So this is what we call simple luxury. Uh, we want to break away from the interview for just one minute to look at something different. But when we do come back, and this is the thing, for many, many Africans, it has been thought that, well, we uh, cannot have uh, literally this conspicuous consumption in the face of so much need. Where is the balance? Well, we well, we'll want to move to a different story, but that is a question to ruminate on, and we'll be back with you in just a couple of minutes. Now, Valerio Pondo is a woman who's making heads turn at her farm, where she does ornamental farming with a big focus on poultry. She rears different kinds of chicken, some of which have spectacular footage and very outstanding features. Tobias Chanji caught up with her at her Greengate farm, and this is that story. Most Kenyans regard chicken as a delicacy to be fried, roasted, stewed or cooked in any other way before being served with staples like chips or ugali. <coughs> but not here at Green Gate Farm in Kuale. The sight is surprising at first before turning to wonder and astonishment. Yes, these are all chicken. But you may be unable to slaughter and eat these ones due to their looks. They come in different colors, types and shapes. These ones walking along, looking like they are in the 1980s bell-bottom fashion, are called pecking booted bantam. While the small ones with carved saddles are Dutch bantams from Holland. Polish bantam of a white comb, similarly to what our land friends put on their heads. Valerie's collection of strange but beautiful birds is not limited to just chicken. She also keeps various types of geese and other birds. Valerie tells us the journey she has traveled in embracing this rare type of farming. Um, idea I from my partner, Sabwa Kona Passion, Yaukulima. Uh, from the late father. She later on decided to showcase what she does by displaying the birds at Mombasa's agricultural show of Kenya. Some of the birds are born from within the country, but others come from outside. Sisi sana Kenyans and tunapenda kuku tunamwangalia na size kwa sababu ya nyama. Lakini kuna watu ambao wanaangalia kuku at another angle kwa huyu inaweza muweka kama pet. But just like any other job, ornamental bird farming has its own challenges. Changamoto sana kwa bird keeping magonjwa. Kuku hiyo ndio kubwa zaidi na mgonjwa mwingi ambao una strive huku ni e fox. fox. So just what do these birds feed on and how available is it? Chakula wananunua sana from faida feeds. Wananunua kienyeji mash. Wana feed sana kienyeji mash na napenda kuku wangu sana wa free range. The farming is beneficial in that apart from its low cholesterol on those who will eat, she has managed to create employment. Kwa kwa wale wengi ambao nimewauzia sijawahi sikia ile naweza kula. Mimi mwenyewe ni nguvu sana. Permanent. 
She says that she has her own way of getting her market as there are very few people who do similar business. Sana natumia mtandao. Hapo ndio nimekuja kugundua kuwa pia ndio napenda na inaniwezesha kufikia my target market. And what is the vision? Ningependa kufanya hapa mahali pale kama an exhibition center. Nishawahi kufanya before nikapata local school for go to primary for a class ili visit nilifanya for a trial. Class ili visit na watoto walifurahika sana. Most farmers will rear chicken for meat and eggs, but for Valerie it's just for ornamental purposes. Tobias Chanji, KT News, Kwale County. Well, believe it or not, some of those chicken right there go for as much as 500,000 Kenya shillings. So indeed, that is still part of the luxury conversation. Of course, not a chicken that is expected to be eaten, but one that is expected to be displayed thin and maybe even loved. Now, Rwanda's President Paul Kagame has challenged government leaders and industry players in Africa to invest in young techpreneurs who often don't manage to see their tech innovations succeed due to lack of proper funding. The Rwandan leader who was speaking at the opening of a global gathering for stakeholders in the science and technology innovation sector also called for more efforts in bridging the gender gap when it comes to female representation and participation in science-related issues. KTN Skigali-based correspondent Eugene Anangwe has details on that story. Now, just a week after hosting what organizers termed as a successful extraordinary summit of African Union heads of state, Rwanda is yet again hosting another important forum, the next Eastern Forum Global Gathering right here. And of course, what conversations are happening right here include those of leveraging science and technology in human development. Of course, uh, President Paul Kagame was the guest of honor here, and in his opening remarks, he did mention that clearly a lot of learning will be taking place out of this particular forum and of course he mentioned that for far too long Africa has accepted to remain behind but he was happy that this is slightly changing with governments taking uh, the importance of science and technology seriously in their national strategies and policies. There is clear evidence of forward movement and the sense that the moment is ours to seize. We have what it takes to do so, not least because of the growing ranks of smart and creative young people who are the foundation of Africa's future. President Paul Kagame also saying that Africa will not work in isolation towards this journey of transformation using technology and innovation, but also importantly uh, saying that it is very important for governments to invest in its youth that are actually out there every day trying to invent uh, but lacking funds to be able to see their inventions, uh, see the light of the day. Let's use the resources we have to give these talented African specialists the chance to grow and compete professionally. For far too long, science subjects have been seen as male-dominated areas, but President Pukagami challenged his peers and uh, those in uh, the industry to actually try as much as they can to bridge the gender gap as far as sciences are concerned and insisting that women should not be left behind as far as technology issues are concerned. Whatever the causes may be, we have to dedicate ourselves to closing the gap because opportunity will never be equal without equal access to knowledge. But as Africa catches up to the next, to the rest of the world, we cannot afford to leave our women and girls out of the equation. 
Now, the next ancient forum will be taking place for the next three days and conversations around financing of techpreneurs is one thing that will be focused on right here, especially noting the fact that many techpreneurs usually lack funding to be able to fund their projects and take them to the next stages, including the prototyping, the testing uh, in the market. And so conversations will be centered on uh, how do they move uh, the projects from the lab to the market. This is one of the things that will be talked about right in the forum. There will also be a presidential debate just to try and see how, uh, you know, governments, policymakers are taking seriously the issue of uh, driving their economies using knowledge and science as far as, uh, you know, economic development in their countries uh, is concerned. Amina Mohammed, the CS for Education, is representing Kenya right here at this particular forum. And of course, we'll be bringing you up-to-date information